favorite favorite uh, city to work in? Favorite city? Uh, I've enjoyed uh, Houston, Texas, because that's where I you know was Mid South territory, and it's where I became hacksaw and really got my first big break. And the fans just kind of uh, was always a, a good town for me, Houston. New England. Boston area. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say I was gonna say New York and Boston Gardens. They, just the electricity in those buildings were just absolutely awesome. Oh yeah, here in the states, yeah, you know you made it when you walked into the garden. Either one, they were both legendary. Yes, you know, to, to boldly stand where all the favorite and favorite fans have uh, been for years and years and years. Hardcore fans. Oh yeah, yeah. And also to be in Boston Gardens with the Celtics. Just had so much, you know, so much with that building. History. So supposedly there was a big rumor that uh, Ricky the Dragon lost his iguana in the uh, old Boston Gardens. <laughs> 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 it was a rumor. It grew to 10 feet long eating the rats. In the old <laughs> yeah. You could never find it. Got a in Boston Gardens. Right? A lot of rats there, so it never yeah. had to leave, right? Well, well, there's a lot of rats there, all right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Froggy. Uh, Whoa. Go ahead, who's next? Uh, Hacksaw. Uh, I'm a huge Mid-South fan from back when I was a kid. Sure. Who was your favorite opponent from the, the classic guys that were in Mid-South back then? Yeah, uh, DiBiase. DiBiase. Yeah, without question, you know, because I, I started wrestling at uh, 25 years old and wow. I wasn't uh, I wasn't really a, a wrestling fan. I was a football player growing up and so uh, guys hated to wrestle me, you know, because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ted was a second generation wrestler. I think any of those second generation guys, Kurt Henning, uh, Jake the Snake, mm -hmm. guys that grow up in the profession understand the business a lot better. And, uh, and Ted taught me a, a whole lot of things. Uh, and now it's gone full cycle. Now I wrestle the young kids that don't know what they're doing. They're right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's gone the full cycle now. <laughs> What was your favorite match, all of you guys? Uh, well, I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, again, we're talking about Madison Square Garden, uh, Andre the Giant main event, Madison Square Garden. You know, I, I grew up in upstate New York, and so as a kid, my dad would take me to the garden to see different events. So just to be wrestling main event at the garden, you pull up to the garden, you see your name yeah. on the marquee, <laughs> and um, the, versus Andre the Giant, yeah. I mean, it was a, awesome. a double whammy, a highlight of my career, actually. Master Square Garden, Bam Bam Bigelow, heated feud, absolutely <laughs> awesome, and then also uh, Shawn Michaels, WrestleMania, Caesar's Palace, Excellent. WrestleMania Nine, definitely. Uh, me, I can't name a, a particular town, but the first time I climbed in the tag with Hulk Hogan, you know, here I went from a uh, kid out and wrestling in small territories, being brought in there, coming in as tugboat, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, I'm like. This guy's, you know, hey, you know, and he's wrestled the who's who, and he took the business from here to the next yeah, level yeah. and entity, you know, and nervousness. I, I had to pee five times before I went up into the ring, <laughs> you know, but it was great. It was a great experience and a, and a great part of my life. Awesome. Yeah, brother. Uh, from like a business perspective, the, you know, 20 years ago versus now, as far as the talent, as far as the workout ethic versus you know any extracurricular to get you know you've got the big guys like you, you guys were the big guys then and now they've got guys like you know DiBiase's son and Cody Rhodes and guys like that which do you see as the better part of the business that versus today as far as like the big guys the heavyweights versus now you've got you know guys that are in the 200 250 pound range uh, I think my opinion that the the business evolved a whole lot the kids are much more professional nowadays you know uh, they got their iphones their tablets and all that stuff you know back in the old days we guys we wrestled a lot more often and uh, there's a much more party atmosphere we're more like a rock and roll band than you were like sports team a lot of people try to compare us to a sports team we're like no no we're more like a, a rock and roll band <laughs> and of course uh i think though back in our generation 
we had guys developed their own characters, they came up with their own interviews. So I think in that way it was it was better. You know, you don't have a bunch of writers giving you your, your verbiage for Correct. your interview, you know. And so in that way I think it's better. But as a whole I think the kids are, are much more professional. Of course the business has evolved into right. a, a corporate business so they're very aware they can't have guys out you know, partying like we did in the old days, you know, it's a different business. Definitely, and, and I agree, but from, from my era, the storylines were so much better. Everyone had character. Yeah. You know, you don't see everyone with characters today. Nobody yeah, a, a yeah. lot of the guys are exactly the same, but just like Hacksaw said, the business has evolved to a business that's now spanning 150 countries, 30 different languages. WrestleMania is doing a hundred million dollars on the pay-per-view, so it's grown, got better, but there's some things that it just can't compare to our era. And also, what he mentioned, family, it was unbelievable because we would go out, we'd have a good time afterwards, but when we got to the building, everyone back there, World Wrestling Federation, everyone went out and gave 110% every single night. So it's tremendous how we'd go out and have a great time, but we'd be in the building, putting it 110% every single night, from the first match, to the last match. It was it was totally different then too. You got so many competitive matches now, but back in that uh, era, we'd go out the first match, second match, we'd actually truly build the night up to the main event. So it was a tremendous time because when the fans would leave then, they would leave happy, totally happy and exhausted. Well, I have to agree with both these gentlemen. I mean, you know, the business has evolved. Now it's a PG business. You know, it's controlled a lot by the networks as far as what and how violent you can be and you know from where we came from back in the day my first territory was uh, like being in a street fight every night for two or three hundred nights we yeah. we wrestled no lie no less than 300 days a year i wrestled for over wow. 18 years and no less than that sometimes you did double shots yes you know it was planes trains automobiles sometimes you were in a boat okay <laughs> <laughs> going from one place to another wow. you know what i'm saying there's a lot of egos you got to remember we're we were on the road with each other more at home with our families you know, people get bored, stuff happens, you know, uh, we do stuff to entertain ourselves back yes. in the day, <laughs> and uh, some people sit back and laugh, you know, but I mean, it was a different business, it was a different era. And the characters, it's not the one or two guys that are on top that control the business. Everybody that came to wrestling and has always come to wrestling has their likes and their dislikes as far as characters go. But the bottom line is, you know, maybe somebody don't come to see Hulk Hogan. Maybe somebody, somebody doesn't come to see The Rock. Mm -hmm. You know, they're coming down there. They like the guy that's working the first or the second match in the building. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The, what happened to the midgets? You know, when they used to come in all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, the women, when they wrestled, that you know, some of them where you thought were guys were wigs. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, it was the business, the nature yeah. of the business. Yeah. It was rough. Yeah. It was tough. You got paid per night. We were independent contractors in the day. And... Uh, if you didn't work, you didn't get paid, man. Right. You know what I'm saying? We were like uh, on the road truckers, but you know, making our living a different way. You know, but I mean, love the business. If I had to do it completely over again, I would do it again. The people, the friends that I met, whether I liked somebody or I disliked somebody, the, you know, the, uh, the cast of characters in the business yeah. made the business what it is. You remember that the wrestling business started in the circus sideshow. So we kind of continued that pace, you know what I'm saying? But it was a great business. Yes? Yes, and we think about the, that um, the Tolly Diva, you know, that, do you see it? The Tolly Diva? Yeah, I've seen it, yeah. Yes, I did. Well, that back in the day, a lady wrestler was a lady wrestler. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now they're all divas. They're yeah. all divas. Yeah. Sherry Martell should knock you out in the heartbeat. Yeah. Bam! <laughs> and, and if I was like, in the fight, I'd want her on my back. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Okay. So a guy asked my wife, he goes, aren't you worried about Jim being around all those young, beautiful divas? My wife's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, honey. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, my goodness. Uh, yes. Me, me. You, you. Freddie Shuley, you were known as Freddie Sparta as the referee back in the early 80s. Pretty much your prime was early 80s, mid 80s. You had some pretty memorable matches that you refereed. Many. There may not be a lot of people in the room that are familiar with some of those matches. You want to talk about some of those? Yeah. You bring up some names and then I can. Andre and Hogan. Okay. Andre and Hogan. Well, let's stop before that. Let's go with Bruno San Martino. Yeah. Do that. Bruno was, uh, although Bruno was just mainly a New York man, but when I refereed Bruno in Madison Square Garden or Boston Garden, when he made his what we call a comeback, you could literally not hear yourself talk. 
that's how deafening the, the crowd was. Yeah, you, don't, you don't see that today, even in these big 100,000 people houses. I mean, people believed in those days. Uh, when they, there was a lot of shooting too in, in those days. Oh yeah. Um, especially if I got one of the heels got a little over, you know, and the baby face would make a big comeback and I've been in a lot of brawls with them. There are times in the ring I'd have to say, guys, just relax. You know, we all, we got to work tomorrow night. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, they, when I started in 1972. The, the boys then were boys that when they got into work, like these gentlemen said, they got in there with, whether there was 10 people in the building or 100,000 people, they worked there hard and there was no slacking. They, they knew how to work. They had psychology, which today I believe there's no psychology anymore. It's just mm -hmm. everybody, everything is told to them what to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, but not in those days. The boys worked harder and they, they loved the business. They weren't there for the, they were there for the money, but they weren't there for the money. Yeah. They were there because they loved wrestling. Mm -hmm. Same with a referee, same with us. I mean, when I started, we were getting $5 a night doing six matches. It wasn't the money, it was because we loved the business. Mm -hmm. We loved wrestling. Same with these, that's why these boys are here. Mm -hmm. a, a, a good example of that is recently I went back to uh, a Raw TV show and one of the young producers came up and said, Hacksaw, here's your verbiage for your interview. I said, my verbiage for my interview? How's some punk kid going to tell Hacksaw Jim Duggan how to cut his interview? And they're like, well, this is what we want you to say. I'm like, well, send me my check, you know. And I think you lose a lot of your mannerisms when you've got to of try course. to remember something verbatim. And, you, and then yeah. you'll wait for Tataka to say something, I say something, and Fred Correct. says something. So we gotta, you, you lose all your mannerisms, I think. It's hard to... Uh, I got a lot more respect for actors now when they see them delivering their lines and acting natural. It's it's, uh, it's harder than it looks. Well, yeah. people from the entertainment industries came into our business, meaning the Hollywood industry, movie industry. Well, back in the day, the only people involved, like Pat Patterson, were guys who were wrestlers, experienced with our business. That's where it's changed, too. You've got people that don't truly understand wrestling in today's business as compared to back in that era. They were actually wrestlers. Chief J. Strombo, Pat Patterson. But as critical as everybody is, I mean, as we all are about the business, as Mr. Tonk was saying, you know, 80,000 people at WrestleMania, 140 countries. Just mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago, I was over in Denmark and Sweden uh, that the Tonka told me about. Uh, I do a lot of charity golf tournaments with the NFL guys, and I'm like, world champions? <laughs> Where in the world have you boys been? Yeah. You know, it's amazing <laughs> the uh, appeal of wrestling around the world. The only thing that can really compare with it is uh, soccer. Yeah. Correct. Worldwide. Yeah. Well, you remember in 92, we went to Wembley Stadium. Yeah. About wow. two weeks after uh, uh, Michael Jackson was there, who broke the stadium record. And we broke his record when we came in. Actually, awesome. I think the uh, WWE holds the record for most arenas in the world because the footprint is just the ring and everything else is <coughs> seats where a concert, you know, that has a stage or yes. a, nice, a basketball game. So actually, WWE holds the record for a lot of arenas. I think 93,000 people at uh, Pontiac Silverdome, mm -hmm. WrestleMania 3. Mm -hmm. Well, just last few years, we've actually been breaking the record of the football stadium themselves. You know, they build it for football, but we actually come in and break the record. So that's we pretty put powerful. On the field, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so what do you think about uh, the Chris Benoit? Chris Benoit, I yeah, think. Yeah, any, any good memory about him before? I didn't know Chris too well myself. I just know that wherever he went, he would bring his young boy with him. He was a, yeah. a, obviously a loving father. I mean, the guy must have had some kind of a mental breakdown. I mean, something drastic happened because that was not the guy that we'd see in the uh, dressing room. No, I traveled my first round for the first five years. I was actually running the roads with Undertaker. But my second run with SmackDown, it was Rey Mysterio, Chris Benoit. Uh, Chavo Guerrero would always get get together and I was with Chris Benoit right before that time and no one seen it I mean he didn't say anything it was no red alarms going off I mean 
like Axel said, he, his boy would be in the locker room with us. Yeah, dressed up in the yeah, suit. Yeah, dressed up yeah. for the, you know for the love of the business. And he was always and yeah, and Chris man. Ben, yeah, always professional. Gave one hundred and ten percent every single night in the ring. Phenomenal wrestler. I mean, it's unfortunate that we can't speak of him in this industry. We totally disagree with what he did, of course. I mean, there's yeah. no reason to do what you did. I mean, he totally wiped his whole history and name, the great name that he had in this industry, was totally eliminated. Yeah, that chance be the whole thing. Yeah, of course. Oh, totally he eliminated. was tremendous. He was tremendous, tremendous. in Japan. Yeah. He was a tremendous athlete. I seen him two weeks prior to that, that happening, right here in Tampa, when they wrestled here. And uh, I was backstage with my boys, and uh, you know, he came right up to me, and we were talking and that stuff, and uh, you know, and then I, that two weeks later that happened, I mean, broke my heart, you know, my, you know, he was a gentleman and a scholar, and always were very, yes. very professional. Yeah, I don't think anybody you know, saw fans, it. Yeah. Nobody yeah. was there. Nobody, you know, they can only assume what happened, and God forbid, you know, you, people just fly off and want to blame this, blame that, and the other thing, and it's it's heart, you know, heart wrenching that his family and her family were put through this. Yes. You know, and for that to happen, it's, you know, and, and there's no taking it back. It you happened. know. Yeah. What are your thoughts um, coming from the old school mentality of the performance center now? Kind of being almost like a wrestling ma like factory. To, to, have you guys been to it at all? The performance center? In yeah, Island? I have. I Personally, uh, I disagree with it. Of course, you know WWE doesn't pay much attention to me anyway. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, because I, they're going around recruiting guys to bring into the performance. Center. Correct. Whereas we do the independent shows, and you might be in you know some South Dakota somewhere, and this young guy's been trying his whole life to get the break doing the independent shows, and he'll never get called to the uh, the uh, performance center. They kind of pick and choose who they bring in. And again, I think you get uh, you know kind of cookie cutter type guys. Of if you course. Have the, all the same guys coming in and learning the same way, you don't get the diversity you have from guys coming from different territories. Plus, it was a lot harder when we started to get into the business. So you really had to work hard. You had to perform every single night. You had to get better with your trade every single night. It's too easy to get involved in our business. Just like TV, it's too easy to get on TV nowadays. I'm not, mm -hmm. not just talking about wrestling, I'm talking about all these different reality shows. It's so mm -hmm. easy to get on TV. In our era, you really had to have something to appeal to be on TV. Honey it was an honor. Yeah. Boo -boo, I mean, right? you could be Honey Boo Boo, correct. I mean, yes. It's so easy to get on TV. <laughs> well, you know? House. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. so, you know, training then was totally different. And plus, you were being trained by the proper guys. So, I mean, WWE is fantastic, of course. You know, but back in that era, you know, mostly veterans were truly teaching those guys that were breaking into the business. A lot of uh, what I've seen, I mean, we came back from a time when there was still territory. I was glad that I, I was in that time in my life where I was able, I, I, I was working brand new in the business, working with guys I'd watched on TV when I was younger. You know, I have family members that uh, now that are, were legends in the day, okay? And, uh, you know, to have that opportunity and pay my dues and stuff like that. And I think the way things are now, you know, I remember that, you know, three guys sleeping in a one bedroom, you know, uh, somebody knowing the rent a car lady at the down place and we rent a car, split it four ways, split the gas, sleeping in, you know, guy with the girlfriend gets the bedroom with the wife and uh, <laughs> the other two guys get the front room, okay? <laughs> Mystery date. But I mean, uh, it, it was a different time, different place. And like you said, you know, like Freddie was saying, you know, that, you know, you weren't making that much money. You're making mu as much as if you're working six, seven days a week. So you're doing double shots. You're doing, you know, two times in one day in different towns, uh, you know, and, and it meant something when you got up there. And then when they came after you looking and had the opportunity, you know, people for years when I was working with WWF were sending tapes every day, hundreds and hundreds of tapes they get to the office every day. And they still do, I'm sure. Yes. You know what I'm saying? There's, and the thing with the business now, there's only a couple of places to go. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's so many people that I want to be a wrestler, just like football players. How many great athletes come out every year, basketball players, football players, baseball players, you know, and they're phenomenal. But it's, you know, who gets the brass ring to go to the next level. But with the wrestling business, I believe the cookie cutter deal, like you're talking about, a, actually a wrestling factory, you know, takes a lot away as far as credibility and respect for the business, yeah. you know, and being, a, you know what I'm saying, respect, it's like somebody giving you a lot of money and you, how many millionaires hit the lottery and are broke, 
you know what I'm saying? But somebody that works their way and, you know, there's been guys up there who have been millionaires four or five times and lost everything and garnered it back because they had that work ethic. You know what I'm saying? And they, they wanted to do better. Not just the opportunity to get to po from point A to the next level and then you're like, you get the big head because you're getting the big push on TV, you know, and you're believing your advertisement, okay? When you're Joe Jabroni, you know what I'm saying? When you get into a real fight, you couldn't knock your way out of a paper bag. You know, it's kind of that way.